started, I'm going to start by reading a brief disclosure. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's workshop by Zoe Financial. This is not to be taken as investment advice and should not be relied on for such advice or as a substitute for consultation with professional accounting, tax, legal, or financial advisors. The observations made are independent of Zoe Financial and should not be read as financial recommendations. Today's workshop is hosted by Andres Garcia Maya, and we're going to be just, we're going to be covering how a tough economy can threaten your retirement. Andres Garcia Maya is our CEO and founder. Prior to Zoe Financial, he was an executive director at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, where he helped oversee over 300 billion in assets. He is a CFA charter holder and obtained an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. There, he received both the Joseph Wharton Fellowship for Outstanding Record of Academic Achievement and the Torgo Foundation Fellowship. With you, Andres. Thank you so much, uh, Alexandra, for the intro and for all the hard work on the marketing team to put uh, the webinar uh, together. So today we have uh, a really interesting uh, uh, webinar workshop, if you want to call it, uh, on a topic that we've gotten a lot of questions uh, from uh, from clients, from prospective clients, from newsletter subscribers, etc. Uh, so we figured we would bring in the heavyweights to talk about uh, this topic. Uh, so today, uh, Steve Morn is joining us. Uh, Steve is a wealth management financial advisor at CapTrust, uh, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, is the largest independent advisory firm in the country, right? That, that's correct, yeah. He serves as a principal and financial advisor responsible for providing comprehensive advisory services. Prior to joining uh, CapTrust, Steve was the principal advisor at Warren Wealth Management. Mm -hmm. Steve has a passion for the outdoors, and a few of his favorite hobbies are skiing, sailing, sports, and traveling, and we're just really excited to have you uh, join us today, Steve. Glad to be here. Awesome. So let's just go ahead and, and, and get started uh, on this topic. And um, I guess I'll start just with uh, our mission first. I know that there's a, uh, a number of folks that are joining today that are, are newbies, if you will, to, to Zoe. So I'll take just kind of a, a second to uh, introduce ourselves. So Zoe Financial's mission is to accelerate wealth creation through exceptional client experience and innovative technology. Uh, and basically, uh, I'll cover this at the very end of the presentation, but the reason we do these webinars is that we feel that the best way to accelerate wealth creation is by making sure people are well-educated on these topics when it comes to investments, when it comes to planning, uh, especially for retirement. Uh, so this is why we do this type of webinars and you know, we're really proud of having uh, uh, people like Steve join us. So what are we gonna cover? First, we are going to cover what's happening in the economy, uh, what's happening in the markets. We'll keep it fairly high level just to set the stage to talk about how what's happening in the economy and markets could affect your retirement, right? So uh, we'll cover the retirement cost factors to consider, the retirement income sources, which are kind of think about the main variables when it comes to your retirement. And then we will um, ask a couple of questions of our expert here and we'll open it up to Q&A. And we always make sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A. If you have questions throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to put it into the Zoom um, chat uh, or you could also no, actually that's probably the best way you could also email us you know I'll put up in the screen in a second uh, you know the best place to do that throughout so with that uh, let's go get ahead and, and get started on the topic of uh, of the economy right so we put up this this uh, slide up which is looking at uh, CPI uh, which is one of the main measures for uh, for inflation, right? Uh, consumer price index. And it's showing over time on the right how that CPI index has done, right? So there's been years in the 70s uh, for some folks on, on the call, then, you know, they might recall how high inflation went up, right? To 12, 15 percent. Uh, and then more recent history has been actually closer to, you know, one to three percent up to 2021 where uh, inflation has really uh, taken off, right? So this is uh, a topic that most people are probably why you're here, right? You, you read it on the newspapers, you see it on your newsfeed around inflation. 
And no doubt that chart on the right shows why it is such a big deal, right? Because we've seen a significant uh, spike. So I'll stop there for a second. And I don't know if you have any comments, Steve, on this slide, but I know you have, a, you know, on the next slide, some, some further insights around the topic of inflation. Yeah, I mean, it's this is inflation we haven't seen in a long time. And uh, the big concern here is, the Fed is fighting inflation. They just increased interest rates again yesterday, 75 basis points. And their main job is to try to get these spiraling prices under control, <clears throat> back down under that 3% threshold, hopefully. Uh, but it's been extremely low for, for quite a few years um, after it got so high in the, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. We even were, you know, for a number of years, the biggest fear was deflation. If you, if you could, if you could exactly recall right. that, it sounds crazy to <clears throat> think about now. But uh, for the better part of the 2010s, the biggest fear was actually uh, deflation, not inflation. And here we are now. This stat I thought was uh, an interesting one, just to kind of bring this the point home of why this is so relevant. <clears throat> is that uh, BMO did, has this financial progress index, and the most recent survey showed that one fourth of Americans are delaying their retirements due to inflation, right? Now, uh, this, this uh, topic of inflation um, is at times could be very deceiving in the sense that uh, depending on where you're reading at the sources, some people believe like basically there's no way to bring this down, right? Like it's just kind of skyrocketed and it's not coming back regardless of what we do with the Fed. Others are saying, hey, we do have some control of it um, through interest rates, right? And some say, hey, this is all going to pass us by. Don't worry about it, right? There's very different camps on this. So I thought the next slide that you had showed to us, and you know, we thought it would be worth sharing with the audience, uh, Steve, uh, is this one. So I'll let you kind of talk through it, but it does talk a little bit about, in essence, maybe which areas of inflation are, as the Fed would call them, transitory <laughs> versus which ones are, are, are not. Right. So <clears throat> this was a piece that our um, research department put out at Cap Trust, and they wanted to look at the source of inflation um, and to see how effective or ineffective these raises in interest rates would be. And 41%, um, the biggest portion of the inflation, is it, they estimate is coming about as a result of the Russia-Ukraine situation. And Jay Powell, as he's talking to Congress, he mentions this too, that, hey, whatever I do with interest rates, it's not going to fix anything in Ukraine, and it's not mm -hmm. going to fix these high energy prices. 24% um, is kind of a hangover from the pandemic, uh, the extreme amount of liquidity injected into the system and the money sent out to try to combat basically the world economy closing down. and uh, that will that will correct itself, but workers were not uh, producing goods and services, um, and you had all this influx of money, and you have too much money chasing too few goods. That's the that's the definition of inflation, and higher interest rates will not combat that either. So the thirty five percent piece there, that's the demand driven piece, and that is the part that will be impacted by higher interest rates. As our chief investment officer likes to say, he says it's like the feds are fighting inflation with one arm tied behind their back. Right, right. I think this is a great chart and really kind of brings point the home, uh, home that what the, the Fed is often saying in these calls, right? And the, and the reason why they mention it again, which is, you know, in essence, we, we, we will do what is what we can, right? Or the uh, for the part that our interest rates will affect, <laughs> but we can't control what's happening in Russia and, and Ukraine, right? That's right. that's and, how to... and that's that's why we don't know. You know, the, we get asked the question all the time: Well, when's inflation going to come down? Right. And my answer right. is: You tell me what Putin's going to do. <laughs> you know, you right. tell me how Ukraine's going to resolve, and maybe maybe we'd have a better idea because inflation <clears throat> had already increased, and then when Russia invaded Ukraine. It really supercharged it. It it uh, yep. Yep. it hurt energy. It hurt wheat. It hurt fertilizers and, and all the rest of that. And it really turbocharged. And that's where 
the transitory inflation became stickier. And so we're kind of wondering, you know, how, how that's going to impact things on a long-term basis. It's just, it's just an, an unknowable at this point. Yep. You know, something that the markets hate is unexpected uh, inflation, right? So that, that, that core inflation that could be kind of estimated based on demand and supply, that's okay. But this kind of shock that creates a ton of uncertainty, uh, the market uh, hates. And no better reflection of that than this next chart, right? Which when we look at S&P 500, since it's, it, it, uh, it peaked in January 3rd of this year, we're now in bear territory, right? It's more than 20, uh, down 20%. And the big part of it, right, is uh, the market takes a number of different factors. Um, but, the, you know, one of the biggest parts is that kind of unexpected inflation, right? That kind of sets the market participants to say things like what Steve said, which is, hey, we don't know what Putin's going to do, right? And as a result of that, it's hard to kind of forecast uh, what comes next for the economy, what comes next for earning. Uh, which is ultimately what you know the uh, the markets care about uh, the most. Do you have any comments here on the on the market side? I know we could probably do a whole section just on the market. Yeah, we could. But uh, uh, <clears throat> well, but, it, it, and it's not just stocks that have come down. Right. Uh, I would point out that on the left side of this graph, you can see the market was already correcting before Russia invaded Ukraine, right. um, and so. We're coming off three real hot years in the stock market. 19 was good. 20 was good. 21 was good. Who knew 20 was going to be good, right, during the pandemic, right. but with all the influx of capital. But then not only has have stocks gone down significantly, we've experienced a bear market, as you point out. Uh, bonds have been just hammered because yeah. as interest rates go up, bonds go down. And the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index is down 10%. Over the same time frame, stocks are down 20. And that's what I think retirees are really feeling at this point yeah. is, hey, wherever I go, it doesn't seem to work. Absolutely. And that's definitely kind of the, uh, the, the tone that we've seen from a lot of people that reach out to us is kind of putting their hands up in the air and saying, hey, you know, I thought I was diversified and uh, this six months has not quite, uh, quite worked out. And that's something that we'll cover in a couple of slides. But I think this next slide is a good way to, to frame the whole conversation around retirement because I think the hardest part uh, is, for, for a lot of people is that they get inundated with news on things that are out of their control, right? So what this chart shows in the middle here is retirement. And then around it, if you start, for instance, with market returns and kind of well, clockwise is the things that are the most out of your control to the to the to the things that you have the most control. And if you think about where we get the most news, right? Your your news feed on your phone is saturated with is markets and what's happening in the economy. And those are things that we don't have control of, right? Um, it's obviously why it creates so much stress because you you don't have control over it. But I like this slide just to remind people that you don't have control of it. And as a result of that, maybe we shouldn't kind of give as much mind share, right? Give as much room in your head, considering there's not much you could do about what's happening uh, uh, in the markets, what's happening in the economy. And if you move clockwise, here are things that you have some control, right? You, could, you have some control on the, the type of job that you go after and therefore the earnings and duration that that career might have. You could try to sleep well at night or sleep more. You could try to eat more healthy so you live longer. You have some control over that. And then what you have the most control over is how much you spend, how much you save, and then how do you allocate your, your investments? You, you know, do you put them to, towards different asset classes and what does that mix look, look like? That is where you have the most control, but it's not necessarily what gets the headline in the news, right? So that's really where we want to focus our efforts through this uh, conversation with Steve is to talk about some of these areas that you do have control towards your retirement. Um, and hopefully that helps you one a little bit sleep better at night, knowing that you are trying to control the things that you can control. Uh, but two, you know, some insights to to help you make better decisions when it comes to these things. 
So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to the next section here, uh, Steve, on retirement cost factors uh, to consider. Now, we started just very high level kind of putting them up here. And I know you had some kind of uh, comments around some of these non-discretionary spending. Yeah. So, um, you know, what I what I tell it, uh, in our office, we help retirees. That's it. I mean, we're very specialized in this area, which is why we were invited to this webinar, I'm sure. Yep. Um, really, cash flow you've not been retired before and cash flow is a learned behavior. And so you make estimates on what you think cash flow is going to look like and just be prepared that it it's not going to be what what you think. Uh, because because you haven't you haven't done it before. So there's right. some basic expenses that um, you don't have a ton of control over. I think your living expenses you have some degree of control over. You know, I can I can cook at home every night. I can go out every night to eat. That's going to make a major impact on my spending. But I mean, utilities, you know, going around the house and closing off the lights when I'm not in the room is probably not going to move the needle too much, right? So, um, anyway, that's that's the non discretionary side. Yeah, and I'm and I'm sure on the healthcare side is also where you probably see surprises. That people think is going to be X, and then all of a sudden, one you know, one of the spouses gets ill, right? And then healthcare cost actually goes up, right? Yeah, and healthcare insurance is a is a monster. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you retire before age sixty five, um, you're, right. you're subject to the Affordable uh, Affordable Care Act, <laughs> which is not so affordable. But there there are <laughs> solutions for that as well. Right. So moving from non discretionary to discretionary spending. Uh, I know we put a couple here and I'll, I'll let you kind of take it away on, on talking some uh, about some of these discretionary. Um, sure. So as you're looking at uh, your, your cash flow goals in retirement, you know, don't just think about the monthly, that, that last slide, the, the kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. You want to bake in some, perhaps travel is important to you when you retire. Um, luxuries, maybe you have a special anniversary. Maybe you want to take the family, extended family on a cruise, things like that. We really need to get a handle on kind of what are your targets. Uh, what a client mentioned to me yesterday, he goes, well, I need to give you my bucket list, don't I? I said, I need to see your bucket list and yeah. uh, with, with some numbers on it. So the one that's surprising to a lot of people is we've listed taxes under discretionary spending. And I think a lot of people feel like they don't have a high degree of control over their taxes. And uh, I've been a CPA. I think I came out of the womb as a CPA. I feel like <laughs> I've been a CPA forever. Um, and you do have a high degree of control over your taxes in retirement uh, because your earnings have gone away. So you're, you're in a lower tax bracket to begin with. But then most people have a pretty good slug of money in IRAs or 401ks or whatever that are pre-tax. And so how we convert that into spendable dollars, you can have a real big impact for somebody by proper tax planning. So that's why I consider taxes as discretionary. And then legacy, are we going to gift to kids and grandkids? Now, or are we going to include them in our estate planning? Uh, so there's kind of living legacy and and uh, at death legacy, and then hobbies. That's the that's what retirees all look forward to. Yeah, that's right. And on the legacy side, I've seen a number of cases where um, people say, "I wish this was even an option earlier on." Right, and in essence. Um, they didn't even know the choices until much later, right? Like once they were already in retirement, et cetera. So the earlier you have these conversations around uh, legacy, the, the better also from a tax treatment you might have. <laughs> so uh, something that I that I highlight because we hear it all the time. It's like, I didn't even know that was an option type thing, right? Or I didn't yeah. know that donor fund existed or ex, you know, whatever type of example you might want to uh, you might want to use right. And Actually, you, on that on that front, right. is there any examples you could you could provide where people kind of get surprised that that was an option when it comes to? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I had one this morning. Um, a brand new client, and um, 
we had done their financial planning and they've done a good job of saving, <clears throat> excuse me, and they have uh, three kids. And uh, so we went through their financial plan with them just this morning and it showed them with seven and a half million dollars at death with uh, and and they're like, well, I mean, that's great, but we didn't really want to leave two and a half million dollars per child behind. And I'm like, well, you know, in the financial plan, we can look at, you know, do you want to give more to charity now? Do you want, you know, what do you want to increase spending? They're, they're now, as a result of the conversation, they're thinking, well, maybe we could afford, they've been thinking about maybe buying some land, building a new house for retirement. That's a typical thing that we see retirees do, and that becomes more real for them. So really, it, it boils down to looking on a long-term basis, kind of what's possible. I think that's what you're getting at, Andres, is, is yeah. uh, what what's possible, because you don't want to just like, you know, live your life and and keep the, the we started the conversation, the wife's like, yeah, I was thinking about where could we cut our expenses? Right. And our message to them was, well, good news. You don't have to cut. We we put right. your current budget in your financial plan. Actually, if you don't care to leave seven and a half million, you could increase spending. So right. it, it's good to get that long term perspective, I think, on things. And, yeah. You know, and it's, it's interesting how that works out, because often that that mentality of, you know, keep a tight purse is what got them there. So right. they need to kind of change that mindset, and it's so hard, right, to to change uh, that mindset. So we 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 see that uh, uh, a lot. Right. Awesome. So that's that's great uh, context, uh, Stephen. This is now maybe a good time to switch gears from call it the spending part of the equation to the growth side of the equation, right? If you if you will, uh, which is on the investment side, um, and this really kind of gets to the crux of the question. When it comes to the recent market volatility, right? Uh, we often get the question around like, what should I change? Or what, you know, what, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong when it comes to my investment, especially if I'm approaching retirement or where I am in retirement. So those are the kind of things that we're gonna address here. And then the first one that you put down here is to make sure that you're aligning your time horizon with, uh, with the investment risk. Um, you know, so this comes back to that question of asset allocation, right? That, that we discussed at the very early on. So, uh, I'd love for you to kind of jump in here and say a couple of comments. I know that you have also have a couple of slides on this topic, but uh, we'll sure. let you uh, share some insight. Yeah, I think one one mistake that people make is um, when they retire, they think they think very short term, and they it it makes them want to have a lot of cash and, and CDs in a, in a year like this in the markets doesn't uh, do anything to frustrate that thought because actually yeah. cash is the number one performing asset in the first half of the year. Right. But um, I think just keep in mind that with longevity and how where that's gone, we will be 30 years in retirement. And so just because you retire doesn't mean your money should. You have long-term needs and inflation is a big thing we need to offset. Hopefully not at this eight or nine percent we're cranking at right now. But um, I think this is a, a great slide in, in just helping you think about the short term. If, if I have needs that I have for next year, I, I don't want that in the stock market. A one year right. result is very unreliable, whereas you know, my cash flow 20 years down the road, I need to get some growth on that. So I offset the impact of inflation. And so this is, yeah, this, this is super important. This is a perfect uh, segue to the next slide. And just to set the stage for the next slide, when we were talking about this earlier slide of bear markets, right? And you mentioned, hey, this is for stock, but bonds didn't do well as, as well. I think the stat was that if you look at a 50 50 portfolio, uh, of stocks and bonds, it was the worst six months beginning of a year in over 50 years, right? Right. It's and a uh, storm. <laughs> it's a perfect storm. And yeah. I think uh, there was a lot of articles of like, does diversification still work, right? Uh, you know, are people getting it wrong? So I think this next slide really brings this point home of 
Um, the fact that diversification in the long in the short term, as we just discussed, might not work, right? Three months, six months, this last perfect storm is an example of that. But this slide here, uh, see if you can take it away and kind of describe, shows that maybe in the long term, it does actually still uh, pay off. Absolutely. So, so these are, let me set the table a little bit here. The, on the far left, you've got the one-year numbers and the 100% stock portfolio. It, the, the best year in, in a long period of time is 47% up and the worst year is minus 39. Very unreliable. Uh, bonds also uh, have had an extremely profitable year, 43%. I don't recall what year that could have been where bonds were making 43%, but they can also lose 8% in a year. And a 50-50 mix uh, could be anywhere from a plus 33 to a minus uh, 15. But it, as you extend the holding period, notice going from one year to five years, how that range of results really tightens in. And so the five-year are rolling five-year numbers. So it's 1950 to 1955, 1951 to 1956, mm -hmm. and so forth. But you see that most five-year periods, you go to that far right, which is a 50-50 portfolio, every five-year period in that chunk of time, that 71-year time frame, has been profitable. And so, the, you know, we encourage retirees not to just think about one year at a time as far as their investment portfolio, definitely for cash flow planning, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's important. But and then going from five years to 10 years, it doesn't really tighten up all that much. It um, mm -hmm. and then you go out to 20 and, it, and, and again, it's it's. Uh, so to me, the real juice here is going from a one-year to a five-year holding period. Right. And, and that's what we embrace in, in how we handle retiree portfolios. Great. And now something that's often mentioned when it comes to asset allocation is uh, dollar cost averaging, right? So in essence, as the markets fall, uh, if you are kind of disciplined and you keep buying, even if it's kind of automatic buying in either your 401k or even if it's your brokerage account, uh, that's kind of like one of the magical things of being disciplined, right? Is that you're essentially buying as things get cheaper. Um, but this next slide I thought was really interesting on, you know, dollar cost averaging versus dollar price uh, erosion. Uh, so I'll let you take it away, but I think this concept of sure. dollar price erosion, I think is one that becomes probably a lot more relevant as you're, as you're in retirement. Exactly. Yeah. So, so dollar cost averaging is a freebie. So when you're accumulating money, it works incredibly well. Um, so in this example, you're buying $10,000 per period, whatever the a year, a mm -hmm. month, whatever it happens to be. And the price of whatever you're accumulating is going to fluctuate. And you're going to keep putting in that $10,000 uh, every time. And so when it's cheaper, you buy more shares. When it's more expensive, you buy fewer shares. So your average cost per share, it's a mathematical thing, will always be less than the average where the, the security has been trading, the security, yeah. the portfolio, however you want to look at it. And so it's, it's a freebie in, in, uh, in portfolio management. And so some people get used to doing that kind of thing. And so then they say, hey, that works so well when I accumulated money. Why don't I just systematically take $10,000 out of this fluctuating portfolio? And the problem is it, it stands on its head. So when the shares are down, the market's down like it is now, you have to sell more shares to produce the $10,000. Right. And so you actually lose money automatically, just like you made money automatically. So what works in the accumulation phase does not work on the disposition phase of your assets. Yeah, and I think this is perfect segue here, which is then what, what should you do about it, right? Because some people in the audience might be <laughs> saying, great, thanks so much, Steve. I wish, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I knew what then to do in this type of situation. So We'd love to hear a little bit of um, the two different kind of retirement portfolios approach. Yeah, so so the the thing that makes uh, retiree portfolio management so challenging is you have two objectives that are absolute pol polar opposites of each other. 
On one hand, you want safe, reliable cash flow for your living expenses. And on the other hand, you need to get growth over the long term to combat the effects of inflation. So what we do at CapTrust is we actually split the portfolio into two different portfolios, one for cash flow, and, and we target five years worth of cash flow. And we have an example of what this looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and the balance of it goes for growth. And that allows us to get through these times in the market that, that get funky like they are this year. Um, this is certainly not a year you want to be trimming your growth assets. Um, but if you have multiple years of your cash needs in retirement set aside in a safe, stable right. environment, then you can, you're buying yourself a holding period to unlock those five year numbers that we were looking at earlier. Yeah, that's right. And then um, a couple of slides here to kind of show the different types of uh, cash flow that that people tend to tap into, right? So income sources. Um, and, and this slide, we could just kind of keep it at a high level unless you want to double click in, in any one in particular. But these tend to be kind of the go-to. Yeah, these are these are the, the possible sources of income that people might have. They might have rental properties. They might have deferred compensation plans, things like that. Um, Social security is is ripe for planning activity because we have, if you're married, you have spousal benefits and so forth. So having a good social security claiming strategy makes sense. So you want to maximize what you get out of these income sources, but that's not going to be enough to, to meet your to total cash flow needs. But you start with taking an inventory of what kind of income do you have coming in. That's right. And then uh, talk to us a little bit about kind of the, the cash flow bucket in particular. Yeah. So in the in the cash flow bucket, um, you take the, the the total amount that you need minus these income sources. And the difference is the money you have to come up with from somewhere else. And right. So here's like that, here's the equation, essentially. <laughs> right. Right. Income needs minus whatever whatever sources of income you have is the net needed from what we call the income stream accounts. And um, that those income stream accounts, that's where we're targeting five years worth of spending. So that's where we want to bake in the uh, discretionary savings that, you know, are, do, you, do you see a car replacement coming in the next five years, those kinds of things. And that should be nowhere near the stock market. It needs to be in safe, reliable investments, government bonds, corporate bonds, CDs. I, it, CDs will come into play. Um, the, the feds are helping us with that uh, aspect. The fed funds rate will directly correlate into CD rates that we haven't seen for a long, long time. That's right. And I love this next slide here because you bring this to life, right? It's hard to see it sometimes in an equation without without bringing it to life. So kind of walk us through this, right? This is a $2 million uh, portfolio example. Sure. This, this is a $2 million example. And um, starting this year, the client was looking for $128,000 of cash flow. Um, his social security was running 31,000. Hers was running 16,8. So we had 47,8 coming in. So that means I need to set aside 80,200 to get them through this year's cash flow. Then next year, we're, we're switching the wife's social security. <clears throat> so she gets a big bump. Um, mm -hmm. And so my income goes up. So my needs from the portfolio go down. But this is just a very simple example of a five-year projection of what kind of cash flow do I need to set aside and, and not let it bounce around in the stock market. So in this case, it's $334,000. So then I take the balance of the 2 million, the 1,665, and I invest that in a growth portfolio. And the, the deal is if we start out in retirement like this, and I've got five years worth of cash flow, if the market, let's say in a year, I get a normal year's worth of growth. And in this case, I've assumed a normal year return is 8.2%. That 
and it's not any big hurdle to to hit. Yeah. Um, whenever the growth side is up a normal year's worth of return, we add a year of cash flow to the income stream account. Mm -hmm. And so if we go through a period of time where there's two years or three years even uh, of negative returns, we just very patiently operate that growth portfolio, rebalance it, take advantage of the market weakness and so forth to rebalance and buy more stock when stocks get hit. Um, then when it comes back up, then I'm in good shape. So the income stream approach, I'm buying a holding period for my growth assets. Yeah, I think this is a great, great way to frame the conversation um, when that topic of what should we be doing right now is if you don't have a plan, right? I know you have here this, this slide just to remind kind of the, the whole setup here of um, if you don't have a plan that kind of thinks about it this way, that is the first step. Uh, the last thing you want to do is to make kind of, you know, emotional decisions based because you saw the headline, right? And, and, and sell stocks or uh, et cetera. So the first, first key is to make sure you, you create a plan. Uh, but now thinking about this, this slide here, uh, Steve, of the five-year cash flow analysis at a time, really brings point, uh, the, the point home of what you were saying in this slide, right? Right. <laughs> Which is, you know, for five-year rolling periods, really we have not seen that 50-50 portfolio, um, you know, be negative. So yep. sure, you know, this year could we could see, you know, the whole year where uh, a 50-50 right. is down. But if you have a five-year plan, you don't have to worry about that, you know, that particular year. It, it goes to the, the first point you made, Andres, is um, we have no control over the markets. This is why you have a disciplined strategy to implement um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and work the plan and, and don't make emotional decisions. I, I think if I can interject too about the media, yeah. um, the media likes to report very short-term things and, and it's pretty sensational in that you have to think about what business they're really in. Right. They're not in the news business. They are in the media business. They sell advertising. And so they get more for advertising if they attract more eyeballs to their program. And so they want to keep it very short and, and sensational. So you're like, oh my gosh, I need to tune in tomorrow to see what they tell me now. And so yeah. the media doesn't really help us in this regard. You kind of have to train yourself on how to watch the news. Yeah. And I think this is perfect segue here to go over uh, the things that you can control, but maybe in more in, in sim simpler language than what we had in that first chart. So I know you put a couple here, starting with a disciplined approach. Right. You've got to have a disciplined approach. <clears throat> um, you don't want to react emotionally to things. We never wonder what we should be doing in a client portfolio. We know what to do. We've done it for decades. Um, we we work our plan, we, we help clients develop these income stream accounts, the cash flow projections. I think five years is a very reasonable time frame to look if we say, hey, what do you want to spend the rest of your life? Well, geez, I'm yeah. giving you a break. I, don't, I have <laughs> no idea. You know, what what do I want to spend this year and next and a few years after that? I have a better, better estimate of. So it all boils down to a disciplined approach to things. Avoid market timing at all costs. That's what gets people in trouble. When people capitulate, which tends to happen at market bottoms, that's what tends to cause market bottoms. Um, is there like, oh, to heck with this. I'm retired. I can't afford. I need to cut my losses short. The, the study of behavioral finance is fascinating in that our brains tell us to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. Right. Market goes up. We say, hey, market's going up. I want my portfolio to go up. I think I'll buy. And then it starts going down like it did this year. And you're like, oh my gosh, I better protect my nest egg. I'm going to lose it all. Um, and you sell. So your brain tells you to buy high and sell low. And, and everybody knows that's the opposite of what you should do. So market timing doesn't work. That is not a disciplined approach. I have yet to find anybody 
that because it, it involves the future, you never know. But if you add the element of holding period to your portfolio, it dramatically increases the odds of a successful outcome. Yeah. And I think on this one, it also, what, what I would add is often where I see this becoming an issue too, is that you talk to your next door neighbor, he, you know, he sold, right? And um, right. now you feel irresponsible that you didn't sold when the market's falling. And then, you know, two years back, it was the opposite. It's like, you know, you see their next door neighbor bought a new car because, um, you know, he was in, he was in Tesla stock all in, right? And you're like, oh, maybe that's what I should have done. So it's avoid the, you know, the fear of missing out that you see other people and it goes back to number one, right? Being disciplined about it. Doesn't mean that you can't have like your, your side pocket of stocks and you're really into, into following stocks, but not making it your core part of your, your retirement strategy. Right. I had, a, I had a client back in 2008 during the financial crisis. And that was, that was just a horrific period. The S and P was down 50% and it just was grinding on and on and on. I remember this, this wonderful long-term client that I've got that he said, he said, Steve, what are we going to do? He says, my buddies at the golf course have decided they're going to sell their stocks and go to bonds. And I said, your buddies at the golf course are dead wrong. Yeah. And, and right. the proof is in the pudding and, and uh, he's, he's a lifetime client. <laughs> That's great. That's a great story here. And then uh, on the last two, I think they kind of go hand in hand, right? Which is investment growth potential. And uh, don't don't only invest in yield generating investments. Yeah, that's a that's a real common mistake retirees make is they think that they need to orient their investments all to these real yielding investments because that's what they want. They want cash flow yield from it. But most most of our clients want four percent or five percent of their of their principal every year in cash flow, and you just can't safely get four to five percent cash flow and long-term get growth. And that's why we separate it into the two buckets, if you will, that um, provide cash flow. And there we're consuming principal intentionally, right? We're, gonna we're not just going to use the yield on the income stream. We're actually using principal. And in exchange for that, we're growing capital over on the growth side of the equation. So you've got to have growth potential um, or, or you're just going to be very disappointed down the road. That's right. Well, thanks so much for, for the, the pointers here on things that you can control. And it's a point that we can't bring home enough, right? These are the things that you could do versus trying to, you know, jet a mind trick the markets. It's not going to work, right? Whatever you see on the right. news, that's going to happen regardless of, of, of how hard you're pulling for the market to go up or, or down. The next section here is, We've done this enough that we know that there's two questions that come up a lot during the Q&A, so we might as well kind of hit them first. First one is, why do you become a financial advisor, uh, Steve? Right? Uh, I see here uh, you're a CPA. Now you're, you know, you're a CPA, CFP, CRPC, but I see the CPA there first. So, right. uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so I, was, uh, I started out my career as a CPA, and CPAs are always dealing uh, in what has happened, right? People, people bring in all their receipts and say, hey, turn this into a tax return for me. And um, it, was, it was interesting and, and, and we were good at doing tax returns, but I would see fact patterns. I'm like, oh my gosh, if you had come to see me during the year, we could have really fixed this. So long, long time ago, I decided uh, that it would be much more interesting to help people plan their futures rather than dealing in historical data. So um, as luck would have it, uh, way back when in 1981, I, I was just a CPA at that point, and the CFP designation was really new. I was living in Colorado at the time, the College for Financial Planning is in Denver, and the CFP used to be a degree, and now it's a license. Uh, so that's mm. some changes that have happened uh, over the course of it. But but I'm one of the first 300 CFPs in the country, and back then it was kind of a gut check because 
we really didn't know at that point the CFP was going to become the dominant right. central planning <laughs> designation. So sometimes you get lucky. And so I, I did that additional schooling to become a CFP. And uh, it's just, it, I love it. It's just been very rewarding. Being a CPA gives me great background because taxes are the biggest expense we all have. And you can really impact somebody's uh, tax bill which which is uh, i love so that, well that's we all I became an we uh, we're all thankful you did become a cfp uh, steve yeah, thank uh, you. i love that story now a question that actually just came up which is perfect timing for the next uh, uh part that we kind of answer up front because it comes up a fair bit the question is and how do you look for you know how do you look for a cfp um you know this is why we exist <laughs> so so how does Zoe uh, help you? Uh, our value proposition to the consumer is twofold, right? So one is curation, right? So our due diligence process is not kind of a rubber stamp. Hey, you have a CFP, you're good to go to be in our network. Uh, every advisor needs to go through due diligence where we're obviously gonna test their knowledge, uh, their process, but not just from a planning perspective, but from an operational perspective, from a technology perspective, how client-centric is this firm and this advisor? Do we think that uh, this is somebody that is essentially going to have that bedside manner, right, to help clients and not kind of be on their ivory tower saying, hey, this is who I am and you don't know anything and, and I'm the expert, right? So we look for every aspect of that kind of holistic approach to who uh, an ideal advisor um, could be certified financial planners, which is what CFP stands for. We see it almost now as the, essentially as the entry point to the conversation rather than the be all uh, of saying, if you're a CFP, you know, I'm going to hire you, right? Uh, it's almost to a certain extent as how a college degree was, you know, 50 years ago versus now, right? It's almost like uh, an entry point rather than than the the end point of the conversation. Uh, and we take this very seriously when it comes to the due diligence. After we go through a, a very kind of systematic approach at the very end of the due diligence process, when we kind of vote on uh, the committee to pass them, uh, the last question is, if you think this advice is so great, will you send your parents to them? <laughs> Right, and if the answer is, well, I don't know about my parents, it's like, well, in that case, you know, why would we send it to somebody else's parents or somebody else's children, right? So we do take that curation uh, process very care uh, very seriously. The other aspect of what we offer is um, making the experience very convenient and easy, right, through technology, so that you could kind of match with the right advisor, interview them, and hire them um, in a much more kind of convenient way digitally than kind of the, the the more traditional way of you know six meetings and in person etc so how the other question that often comes up is how do how do we go about using zoe you could call us 646-680-9244 you go to our website and fill out a quick matching uh questionnaire to get uh, a sense of who you would match uh who you get matched up with and then you could uh, actually schedule time directly with that advisor or you could email us uh, at concierge at zoefin.com. If you have other questions about what we cover here as well, that is the place to uh, send us an email. It's concierge at, uh, at zoefin.com. So that's the section on, on Zoe as well, a little bit about uh, Steve's background. So now let's, let's see how we're doing on time. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's make sure that we have uh, enough time here uh, with, with, uh, with our audience for questions. I'm going to tag this one as answer uh, from Robin had asked the question on CFPs. I'll give it people a second to, to send a couple. Okay, so this is a good one, uh, which is Okay, well, actually, look, I, we're getting a bunch now, and so let me see which one I go with first. Oh, they're both actually similar to to each other. So one is, is it too late to set up the two bucket approach? Uh, and I'm guessing maybe you know, and to 
provide further uh, uh, without having the context, uh, Steve, I'm guessing maybe if they're already in retirement or really close to retirement, then you know, is it too late to set up that approach? Right. So, so the answer is no. It's it. Uh, we may not be able to build out the entire five years at once. So, if <clears throat> let's say somebody has been um, overly aggressive in the portfolio, so the whole thing has been like a growth portfolio, we don't want to sell um, equities at at a bad time. So we're you know we're down uh, not not quite down twenty percent now. We've had a pretty good balance in the last week or so. Um, so, uh, it, it could take some finesse to get there, or it could be that somebody is in a 60, 40 kind of portfolio and we could identify part of the 40% that's in bonds and move that to a separate income stream account and then manage the growth portfolio as an 80, 20, which is pretty much what we do uh, for most people. And so it's a matter of dissecting an existing portfolio or maybe working towards that. And as the market recovers, maybe we only can start with two years in the income stream. Right. Uh, and then you look at how are we going to build that going forward? Yeah. This other one, I mean, goes hand in hand, but I'll just mention it here uh, to kind of bring the point home of what we were mentioning earlier, which is, you know, with the markets down, should I change my plan? Right. That's that's the question. And obviously, without having a, a ton of context, uh, I'll let you kind of go for it. I'll have I have a comment or two, too. But yeah, um, so we'll to you know, it, it depends. Right. So um, you've got to look to see, um, you know, what is the current asset allocation? Uh, it, everything's down. Right. So so um, it's not like one asset class has been just just king of the hill here. Everything in this kind of environment is down. Um, we had a recent meeting with a client. We were looking at their current portfolio and they have quite a value lean to the portfolio uh, versus growth. And which I mentioned to them, I said, you know, in this kind of market environment, that's probably a good thing because value right. held up much better than growth. And I said, how did you come up with that? Well, it turns out the client's father had died about a year ago and the, the dad was into dividend paying stocks and which mm -hmm. tend to be value stocks. And so in their case, we're just going to just click the button and, and just get rid of that value tilt because now our, our research department at CapTrust is telling us that growth is, is pretty much on sale right now. And so we're going to take them back to this strong value tilt to an equal growth value. They're also kind of large cap domestic heavy and light on international and, and stuff. So it's never too late to diversify. And um, so, so that's what we help clients with. There's a, a real finesse to, to moving a portfolio yeah. into the right structure for the long term. And, and we're not going to push a button to do it. We're going to take our time in very thoughtfully working that portfolio to something that's going to work for them on a long-term basis. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And <clears throat> usually, actually, the concern when the markets were at all-time highs is that if people are, say, um, finally kind of said, hey, you know what, I'm going to hire someone to, to help me with this, that it was hard to sell certain things because there were so many capital gains. So if anything, this type of market allows to make shifts without triggering as much capital gains because the right. markets are, That's right. are, are down. So you could lock in some, you know, some tax uh, losses, if you will. Or, and, um, and from that perspective, position your portfolio, portfolio more appropriate to your goals without triggering as many capital gains if you were doing it at all time highs. So we've seen that, uh, yeah, I remember, in, Last year, but that was often a topic of conversation. When they would go to hire the advisor, they, they loved the the where the relationship was going, and they, they would have to be very careful to move anything, right? Because they didn't want to trigger too many taxes. Well, right now it's a little bit easier <laughs> because, yeah. well, because the markets are down. In hindsight, they wish they had taken some capital gains, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would have been better off taking some of the capital. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so another question that I have here, and feel free to. Um, 
share as much as you feel you know comfortable on your side of C. But the question is, what is CapTrust's uh, minimum uh, investment? So somebody that's uh, interested in CapTrust. <laughs> right. So so we look at a million dollar minimum for for uh, for most people. There are some exceptions to that. If um, let's say somebody's not retired yet and the bulk of their money is in a 401k plan, we can help them with the planning for now, you know, aiming towards rolling, eventually rolling that 401k out into an IRA and that kind of thing. But but generally the the assets we're looking for is a, a million and up. Yeah. And what I would add to that is something that we do in our due diligence when it comes to minimums is we ensure that the practices that have a minimum, let's say capture us at a million, that it's commensurated with the value and the high touch that you would expect with that minimum. Uh, meaning just because a practice comes to us and says, well, our minimum is 5 million, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that they'll get in because we're like, well, your value and the high touch service that you're providing doesn't really commensurate for that level of you know, commitment. So we feel very comfortable with captures at a million for, a million for the value and kind of the holistic approach that they bring to what they do. But let's say that you were looking to hire someone and uh, the level of wealth or the level of commitment that you wanted at first was much less than that. That's why we exist as well, right? We're going to find a practice where the minimum might be 500, right? Or 250, where therefore it might be more appropriate for your goals, your current level of wealth and tax complexity, et cetera. So uh, I, I mention all this because often you don't want to look at it in a vacuum, right? When it comes to minimums. Um, and we, we take everything into consideration in the due diligence process to ensure that it, that, that minimum commensurates with the value that, that, that the practice brings. All right, let's see what else we got. I'm also going to check my email to see if we got, sometimes we get email questions instead. Alexandra, do you have anything on your side that you're seeing? On, uh, in the oh, actually, I see one that came in through the chat from Daryl asking, would you recommend hiring an advisor to support dollar cost averaging? Hmm. So I think maybe looking, Steve, to expand a little bit more on, on what you're mentioning, dollar price erosion. Yeah, so, so as you're accumulating assets, um, you're going to have a systematic investment plan and, um, you know, you, you need to keep it in balance. You're not just going to put it in one thing. You're going to add to a portfolio. So for my clients that are accumulating assets, typically we get them anywhere from five years before retirement into retirement is, is our group's kind of specialty. And I know there's other advisors at Zoe that are focused more on earlier in the working careers. But I think an advisor can add a lot of value to keeping that portfolio in balance, adding to the right categories in the portfolio as the clients are putting money in on a monthly basis. That's right. Another one that came in, uh, Steve, here is what is the most effective way to keep track of the two portfolio types that, that, you, were, uh, that you were mentioning? Well, we we do portfolio reports on them independently. And mm. so we have our five-year cash flow projection that we're every year we update it for what the next year looks like. And then um, so you look at that as a separate portfolio that's in very conservative things. So you're looking for 2% return because it's a very safe portfolio. Um, and then on the growth portfolio, that is its own portfolio. So you don't, you don't mingle the two and that's the whole point of doing it this way. So you, yeah. just, you keep up with them separately. So if you're working, you have a growth portfolio now, and when you retire, you still need a growth portfolio. It's just, you need a source of income because you're, you know, you've, you've retired from your income. So you need to replace that income. A side benefit of this whole thing is 
uh, clients feel a real peace of mind in knowing that we have multiple years of their cash set aside to meet their spending needs. So when yep. a market event comes along like this, they know we're doing what we should be doing, which is managing up that growth portfolio, taking advantage of the market volatility, rebalancing, we're able to acquire more equities at a, at a lower price and so forth by just rebalancing that existing portfolio. And they really have, we started doing this 20 some years ago this way, because we think it makes sense from a portfolio management perspective. The other thing we've noticed is it just gives clients real peace of mind. So, so when things go down, it's like, oh my gosh, where do you think the bottom is? I'm like, I don't know, but but nobody knows, right? So right. do you think it will resolve itself in the next five years? Historically, it has. They're like, oh, well, yeah, I guess so. So we've done this through the tech bubble bursting, the financial crisis, the COVID crash, all those major bear market events, and it's it's been highly successful. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question, and this is a good one, which is, do retirement advisors need additional expertise, or do all advisors help me with, with retirement? I, you know, Sorry. yeah, I mean, I think it... it I think by us focusing on retirees, I think we have a skill set for a specific type of client. Um, and um, so I, the CRPC is Chartered Retirement Planning Counselor. Uh, yeah. So that was additional education. But um, I think so. I, you know, it is, if, if you have a medical issue, uh, are you going to go to a specialist or a generalist? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's some generalist doctors that can solve your issue. Might you have better outcomes going to a specialist? Perhaps. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Right. For instance, on social security, withdrawal strategies, et cetera, right? Someone that has a lot more retiree clients is going to have a lot also more kind of ad bats with that type of uh, situation. Uh, so right. I would say that there's definitely some advisors that have a lot more of those type of clients like Steve does. And this is a perfect segue for the last question, I promise here before we run out of time, which is, hey, if I'm 47, I'm not yet re ready to retire, but interested in working with an advisor to plan for the long term, would still be, uh, would Steve be a good fit for me? That's literally what we do for here, a living here at, at Zoe, is you could talk to our concierge desk, uh, you could answer the, the short form and that will inform us if Steve would be the ideal fit. Steve is an amazing advisor, right? But ultimately, we also want to make sure that we align the ideal client for his expertise. So that answering those questions will let us uh, get there. I'm sure Steve doesn't only have retiree clients, right? But what our role here at Zoe is to make sure that we line you up with an advisor that kind of commensurate with a lot of clients that are in your current stage and therefore are going to know a lot more, um, have more, a lot of experience than that back with that current situation. Would you agree with that, uh, Steve? Yeah. It, you know, if you're 47 and retiring, <clears throat> you're still a retiree. You're just a young retiree. Yeah. So, yeah. so good for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had, you had the right parents or you, or you are, are an entrepreneur and have sold a business or something yeah. that, yeah. It has made that possible, but we we've had people retire at very young ages, and it's 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 the same thing. We we do this income stream approach for all our retirees because yeah. because that just 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 makes sense to do it that way. Yeah. Well, perfect. Uh, I think we'll we'll end it there. Let me close this window up and just say uh, thanks so much, uh, Steve, for joining, taking time. Uh, Thank you. Uh, of the day uh, and, you know, helping us put this great presentation, uh, you know, thanks for Captures and the whole team there as well. You bet. And thanks with for that, presentation. Yeah, no, of course. And with that, we'll end it there by saying thank you for you that are joining. Just know that uh, this material will be recorded and sent via email. Uh, so if you want to share with friends and family, you know, please go ahead. I know there's a lot of people that are asking these types of questions. So please feel free to share it with others.